might not know this field computational imaging i'll introduce you to that what that means uh, what that entails what's some good work that has been done in that area and then finally um, you know so as everybody else has some some work in machine learning as well so without taking more time on that so let let me just dive into what we're talking about so the first part of this talk is uh, going to be devoted to some imaging research. What is imaging research? Introduce you to the field and then talk a, talk a little bit about the research work I've done in that area, especially the, the thesis research. And the purpose of going into that is to sort of introduce you um, to, um, let me actually just switch off my video to ensure that we preserve bandwidth. Okay. And um, so, yeah, the purpose of that is to introduce you to what computational imaging is, because that's that's sort of one of those things that gets uh, uh, doesn't get as much attention, but has led to some really cool applications, some of which you've already probably heard of as well. You'll see it when you know the image, when, when I show, show you the images. So, so the first thing I'm going to tell you is, in my opinion, and, and this is a very important part here, when a lot of things I'll be talking about here will be in my opinion, others may have differing opinions and experiences. And it's your, as, as students, you know, take all of that input in and, and understand from that what you may, right? So in my opinion, imaging research falls into three primary categories, right? The two that you've heard a lot about, which is image processing and computer vision. These are extremely popular fields, as um, Saumya was saying in, in her introduction. Because you know, image processing is you know these these definitions are picked out of uh, different papers. So, digital image processing is the use of a digital computer to process images through an algorithm. So, what does that mean? That means you have an image that has already been formed. What you're trying to do is make it better, right? So, making it better means you might be filtering noise, you might be um, sharpening edges, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, when you when you say stuff like that, you might think that. Oh, these are these things that we learned in um, third or fourth year um, electrical engineering, right? Um, yeah, this is true, right? This is very true. So that's that's an important part, right? Some of these things that you are doing are going to have theory from your undergraduate experience also. And some of them, not so much, right? And that's the important distinction to uh, understand that, that it's a continual learning experience and then learning things, sometimes things that you learn in undergrad might be useful for research also, but that's not always the case. And, and we'll go through some of those and, and um, as we go along. So uh, the next field is computer vision. This is, um, you know, this is everywhere nowadays, right? With the advent of deep learning, computer vision has been able to like sort of solve almost so many different problems, right? And the, the, the key thing about computer vision is now image processing is the field where you sort of take an image and you process on it to make it look better, right? What is computer vision? You take that image that say was processed by image processing or not, whatever. You take that and you make it look, you, from that you, you try to extract information, right? You extract information like objects in the scene, extract information like, um, you know, so you probably segment it and then you try to get some information from there. We'll talk about some of those applications there as well. A lot of that has been used in areas like autonomous driving these days and it has actually permeated now into a lot of different fields. And that's why the definition now calls it an interdisciplinary field because though the theory of it emerged from electrical and computer engineering and computer science, it has evolved to a field where it has become now a tool, right? Especially deep learning. And that's an important thing we'll talk about when we talk about computer vision, the, what is, how important is deep learning and is deep learning enough if you want to do research, right? So the final field I'll talk to you about is computational imaging. This is something you probably have not heard as much about. And so the computational imaging, I'll just read out the definition that's here. Computational imaging is the process of indirectly forming images from measurements using algorithms that rely on significant amount of computation. So what does that mean? Let's boil down that sentence, right? So typically when you form an image, say for example, from a camera, it's a pretty straight, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's an easy process. It's a straightforward theory, right? You gather photons at uh, your source and then you read those out. And for each pixel, you have a measuring um, 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 node, right? The, the sensor at the very end. But now when you're talking about things like computational imaging, what you mean is what happens when your measurements are not directly off the image itself? So what are some examples of that, right? Things like CT scans, MRI scans, 
right? Those are different um, uh, examples of those where you don't actually measure the scene in the classical sense, but you have to take some um, measurements of it from, from different sources other than an imaging sensor and you have to compute your image. So this, is, this, is, this, this allows you to do a lot of different uh, imaging techniques, Sorry, a lot of different imaging techniques are encompassed here. And this also allows you to sometimes work with even just images, but with sparser data, right? So the idea is you compute the image as opposed to sensing the image. And, and this is where I'll spend the bulk of my talk because the first two you guys have probably heard a lot about and know a lot about as well. And in the meanwhile, I want to let you know that if you have any questions at any point, you can hold it towards the end and you could that's one option, but it's also an option that you say, hey, uh, can, you, know, you can answer, ask it while I'm in between slides as well. I have no problem with that. So the first one uh, out of the three is image processing. Most of you guys know about this stuff, but I will just briefly introduce what this means. So a few different things that comes in image processing are things like noise filtering, very common application, image deblurring, those things you know very well. And now there are other things like tone mapping, auto white balance that some of you might be familiar with, some of you might not be very familiar with, right? And the reason is these things come in your image signal processing pipeline. So within a camera, right? So when, when you look at a camera, <clears throat> on one end, you have uh, your CCD arrays or uh, ZMOSs that, that gather the photons, right? And once that input comes in, it needs to be processed through a pipeline before you can actually see an image, right? So the way the imaging sensor actually captures it is you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have a capturing element, but the important thing is, yeah, so sorry, the ISP, so I'm, I'm actually talking about the ISP here, right? So ISP is image signal processing pipeline, right? This is at the beginning of a camera where you have your initial measurements and to the point where you come up with the output that you guys see on your phone, for example. The idea is, when you capture these um, different pixels that make up the image, what, what we do is we put color filter arrays in front of uh, each of those um, sensing elements so that you either get red or green or blue, right? And this is typically called a Bayer pattern. So you start off with a, what's called a Bayer pattern, and then you take up that Bayer pattern and then you do noise filtering on it, you do tone mapping, deblurring, and then you turn it into an RGB image. That's what you see on your screen, right? So what are these different things? So all of these are, are the sort of things that people who make cameras, people who make phones like Samsung or Apple or you know, Huawei, those folks have to do, right? In order for you guys to get the images that you do. So some of the different operations that are involved there, the more common ones I talked about, the other ones are things like tone mapping. Tone mapping is where, you know, for example, you come up with an input image like this, where you see some of the, some of the image seems to be overexposed. Overexposed means, a lot more pixels have come in there in, into the uh, into the uh, receptor than the other part of the image. So as a result, what you see is one part is very saturated. You can't really see anything there, right? So tone mapping is taking that um, high dynamic ran range image and taking putting it to an 8-bit image where you can actually see the rest of the scene. So you take something like this, you convert it to something like that. I'm not gonna talk about everything that's involved there. That's an entirely different research topic or to something like that. And another one is auto white balance. Auto white balance means balancing the image so that you could see white as white. That's the simplest explanation, right? You see, you take a pixel which is supposed to look like white and, but you're not seeing it as white. How do you turn it into white, right? So that ends up correcting the rest of the image. So there's, that's, this is also a little involved research. The reason I'm bringing these up is most of these seem like straightforward trivial solutions, but when you're solving these kind of um, um, algorithms, I mean, coming up with algorithms to solve this kind of problems. One of the important things is, you know, you don't have the liberty of using a deep learning um, accelerator all the time, right? So most of these algorithms that you see here run on embedded platforms. So it might be running on your car, right? Where you're looking, you know, towards the front of the car and then you're trying to process the image that comes out of the camera, or it might be on your phone. Both of these have power limitations, right? And especially the phone, it runs on charge. So you can't, you know, process a whole lot of stuff in there. So you have to be mindful about performance. And that's a key, key criteria when it comes to the industry. Unlike, I wouldn't, don't want to say unlike, but 
slightly different from academia where you have unlimited computing resources and you know when what you're trying to do is trying to publish a paper with the best results in industry best results has a slightly different connotation right best results doesn't always mean the best looking image it means the balance between the best looking image and the best performing algorithm so if you have a really good algorithm that gives you an amazing output but it requires a a really large computer to process, it's useless in the industry, right? In, in, in certain applications, of course. But in other applications, it's different. So that, that balance is something you need to strike. And that's something that I learned coming from graduate school to the industry is how important computational resources are and managing them are, right? So that's an introduction to image processing. The next part is computer vision. I'm gonna spend very little time here because everybody's heard about these things these days. Computer, computer vision is basically you take an image that was formed by some sensor and you try to gain understanding about the scene through that uh, image, right? And it could come in various different forms. I'm showing you a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is called semantic segmentation. This is a commonly used uh, algorithm, especially in your autonomous driving applications. And why is this important, right? So what are we doing here, for example? You're taking a scene and then you're trying to understand what's in there. The reason that's important is that this tells you where you can drive, which portions of the road is unoccupied, where are, where are cars, where are people? So you can make predictions on where they're gonna be next. You can also understand where traffic signs are so that you can focus on that, for example, in order to actually be focusing on a traffic sign here right now, so that you can understand what the light looks like and you can make a decision based on that, right? And so, so that's semantic segmentation. There's all kinds of other ones as well. Another very common one is object detection and classification, right? So this is where you look at a scene and you understand what are the different objects in it. You'll see that semantic segmentation and object detection have um, intersections. And that's something, intersections are, even between these fields, you see a lot of inter intersections. But the whole idea is there are some different classifications based on um, uh, the fact that this gives you sort of a bounding box, tells you where a dog is, where a person is, etc. And the purpose of this is also in the context of autonomous driving is to understand what is on the road and then understand where they will be, where they are at this current moment in time. And another important area in the autonomous driving spectrum where computer vision is used is gaze tracking. This is to understand um, uh, the attentiveness of the driver. And the reason you need that is if somebody is falling asleep, for example, on the wheel, you can understand that they, they are, their gaze is not on, on the road, right? By looking at where your eyes are, where your nose and where your uh, mouth might be. Based on that, the car can make a decision to alert us. Right, the drive and the, the you can either have a vibrating mechanism or beeping mechanism that tells you that you need to pay attention. So these are just some very basic applications of computer vision. And these there are there are hundreds and thousands of papers on all of these different areas because this is a really, really hot topic. Some of the work I did in Texas Instruments was in the computer vision area. We 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 in fact use some sense of fusion. I'm not going to go into much of that, but if you if you have some interest, I can share some papers with you and talk to you about that later. So that brings us to our next part: computational imaging. Uh, any questions up until this point, or I can continue. I'll, I'll leave the about five seconds, ten seconds, and if nobody asks questions, I'll move on to the next part. Okay. So, so next part is computational imaging. So this is the case where you sort of indirectly measure your image and you are trying to form an image through those measurements. So that means you don't have this traditional sense of um, measuring a pixel at a time, right? I'm sure most of you guys are very familiar, familiar with this uh, image on the left-hand side. This is the image of the black hole that was um, a part of that, um, uh, that was you know very popular all over the place and people were talking about it a lot. It's, it's, um, it was done through a collaboration between hundreds of scientists across the board. And you might have heard um, uh, the, the Katie Bauman's name. That's actually my advisor's daughter. Um, she was talking about this. She, and I would really encourage you as, as undergraduate students to listen to some of her talks. Um, she's very good at speaking. She's very good at um, painting a picture of what they did to a point where undergraduates can also understand what's going on. And, and you know, take a note to do that because one thing about 
imaging about science, all of that is being inspired to do things by listening to other people. And I think these kind of really cool applications are very important because it it gives you um, uh, you know it gives you a flavor about what what is all of this about, right? Because you guys are doing. Uh, electrical engineering or some of you guys are um, first year students in which case you have not decided right but you go through this whole theory of you know all kinds of signals and systems etc you know uh, probability theory you might wonder where these tie in right where all of these tie in is when you come to these applications and you might not see this if 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 you have friends in industry they might tell you no you don't need any of that perhaps in certain um, jobs you don't but if you really want to deep dive into into some of these subject areas, understanding the theory is very important. So, so you know, I encourage you to do that. So, yeah, without taking much more time on this slide, since we are limited for time, anyways. So, let me. This was the black hole image, and and the way they made this measurement is by creating a virtual. Ad so, to take this actual picture, you need the telescope the size of the Earth, right? Which is not possible, of course. So, what they did was this. They used the uh, telescopes that were already available in different parts of the world, and they create what called what is called a virtual telescope through all of those. And that virtual scale telescope was what they used in order to get this. And that means you had sparse measurements from different areas in that virtual telescope, virtual array that allows you to compute this image. So this is not a direct image anybody saw. This is an image that was computed through what was there, right? So this is behind the scenes. This is all algorithm. Right, so a lot of the work I did at my 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 um, graduate school was in this area because my professor was one of the founding people in the area of computational imaging. Uh, in fact, the um, the name compute the the transactions on computing computational imaging came through him and some others. And this is another one. This is a I'm, what I'm showing here is one of my colleagues' work. This is what he's doing here is. Computer tomography or CT, right? How you like remember? You guys probably know about this in the medical sense, right? But this is for um, a growth of a dendrite. So this is basically a material science problem. But what they're doing here is this is um, this is an element that's evolving in time, but it evolves too fast that if you take uh, images at the regular CT speed, you'll miss most of it. So what they're doing instead is they're um, taking images and um, like taking sparse waves and computing the image. And that results in a reconstruction like this. Now, on this, um, on the other side, on the left-hand side bottom, what I'm showing is what's called a tunable diode laser absorption tomography. This is again something that was done in our lab uh, by another colleague of mine who's in fact now with me in Samsung. He's this research was done with the Air Force Research Lab, and this this what they're measuring here is the plume, the the exhaust of um, what's called a scramjet. You might it's 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 sort of new technology. It's I think it's like five or six times the speed of sound and measuring this is very difficult. So what they're doing is they're, they have tunable diodes at, at, at the, um, I mean, I won't be able to tell you exactly what's going on because I don't really know all the, um, 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 the particulars, but the idea is you have sparse measurements from different areas that you're using to create um, uh, reconstruction of what the actual plume might look like, right? Coming out of there. And then magnetic resonance imaging, obviously you guys know about this. This is what we call MRI. So now, Let's move over to a little bit of what I've done, right? So this, what I'm going to talk about is nothing on what I've done in the industry because you know you don't really uh, the, the industry work you don't really publish all of it. Some of you get to, some of it gets published, but not all of it. So I wanted to talk about this because this is a more deep dive. So this is in the area of computational imaging, but what we did the algorithm is called supervised learning approach for dynamic sampling. But before I go into that, let me just tell you what this is about. So in areas like medical imaging, material science imaging, right? Not all images can be captured fast, right? So what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is sometimes when you're scanning through a sample, you don't acquire the entire image. What you do is hit one pixel area, right? Or one part of the sample, which say, for example, an X-ray. And then you measure the diffraction from that. And then you hit the next part, get a diffraction pattern. Next one, get a diffraction pattern. And based on that, you form an image. So these, for certain applications, one pixel measurement can even take you one or two minutes, right? So that means taking a full image can take two, three days, four days, five days, whatever it may take, right? And that's a lot of time. And especially for things like, like your, your particle accelerators that some people use for so, sort of this uh, 
um, different kinds of energy, uh, like imaging, like the one I showed you with my colleagues' work in um, uh, that dendrite formation. Those take a lot of time, and that time is a lot of money, right? And that means you have to try to get your image with the least number of samples, if possible. So one way of doing that is fastly measuring what you are trying to measure and predetermining the pattern. You could say, okay, I'll take a random set of uh, pixels and then try to form an image, right? Or what you could do is you could uniformly subsample it. So this is what you would learn in your image processing classes. Like, you know, your output of a downsampling is what you'll try to get. Basically, sparsely try to measure it. And then you would try, what you try to do is interpolate the image through computational imaging, right? And so, so what we did was in our research, understand how we can design um, an algorithm so that you could measure an image or actually you can't say you measure an image. You can never measure an image, right? You measure an object to form an image, right? How can you extract the least number of pixels, the minimum number of pixels to get as much information about that as possible? Right? You'll see, you'll understand more about it when we go about, go about what we're doing. Now, so this was a project that was done by myself as my thesis research with my advisors, Professor Charles Bauman and Professor Gregory Buzzard. Uh, Gregory uh, Buzzard was from the mathematics department. My professor, of course, is from ECE and I was also from ECE. And th that was where we did the preliminary research. And then we ended up collaborating with a bunch of different people from all over um, the place so that we can apply it, adapt it for different kinds of imaging. Because, you know, when it comes to the field of computing and image, there's microscopy, there's tons of different kinds of microscopy, right? There's, uh, there are all kinds of other applications, which I'll go through some of those in very brief detail. And, and all of those, could benefit from things like sparse sampling. So I ended up collaborating with some folks in analytical chemistry in Purdue itself, and then Northwestern University in the material science division and uh, the Air Force Research Lab. Those are the guys who actually sponsored my research and then also worked with uh, Argonne National Lab, some people in the advanced photon source, that's like the accelerator that they have. And then also people in, in the material science division as well. So a lot of people put a lot of hard work into this. I'm presenting everything, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort, right? So as I said, the problem formulation, what is this problem? Find the optimal set of pixels, which when measured enables a high fidelity reconstruction of the underlying object. So breaking that down, that means find the smallest number of pixels that will tell you what you're looking at without measuring everything, right? What is the underlying object? High fidelity means very good looking, right? For lack of a better word. And an optimal set of pixels means what are the best set of pixels, right? But the key part to understand here is you can only acquire one pixel at a time. And also you don't know what's out, what, what's there. So it's not like your compression problem where you have an image and you're trying to figure out the best way to compress the information. That's not it, what it is. This is compressive measurement, right? So this also is in that area of compressive sensing where, I mean, this falls in the compressive sensing area as well. So the idea is how can you know what's in there without, like how can you know enough about what's in there to understand where to measure to get a full picture without actually seeing. So it's a, it's a, it's a um, sort of a weird problem. But now I'm gonna go through, now when I talk about this paper, I'm gonna go into a little bit of the mathematics. This is not very complex stuff, just to give you an understanding of how we formulate a problem when we are doing research. And that's one of those things I want to really, really get, get through this talk is that how mathematics comes together with an, an, a problem to solve and how do you model a problem using traditional mathematics to understand and boil down the different problems, right? So, so in order to do that, what we first do is notation, give notation to, to all the different things that we're trying to understand. So what we, the, so we call X, a, a vector or matrix in an in dimension, so we can call it a vector, right? By, by uh, linearizing it. So let's say the underlying image is X and that's what we want to get. We don't know X, right? And let's call a set of measurements that we are trying to measure Omega, right? Omega is the set of all measurements. So basically if you're taking pixel wise measurements, it's the set of all, 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 all those like one, one, all the way up to N, N, right? And then you have a set of measured locations. So this is setting up the problem. This is important for you guys to understand. This is how we set up a problem, right? So now what is my problem? Adaptive sampling. So that means I have already measured some pixels. How do I measure the next pixels? 
the next pixel, right? How do you, sorry, how do you determine the next pixel to measure? So that means I have to set up all those different parts. That means what do I need X? What is available to me Omega? What have I already measured S? What are the actual values of those measurements? Put it in a vector YK. And then using that YK, can I come up with a guess of what X looks like? That's what we call a reconstruction. The reconstruction is X hat, right? So the idea is you want X, you have X hat, you came up with X hat through your measurements Y. And those Y measurements at, at locations S, and you have all the other places that are available to you, which is the what's remaining of Omega when you take out S, right? So now the problem definition becomes, I'll boil this down to you. So what you have is, first of all, what we are, how we are formulating the problem is, you measured some K pixels already, because in any problem you assume that you measured some, you want the next one, right? Even when we start this algorithm, we can't start from scratch. We start with some random measurements, like five or 10 here and there, and then we try to figure out what the next one is. So the problem is find pixel location that maximizes the expected reduction in distortion the most. So let's break down that problem, right? So find the pixel location. So you're trying to find a pixel location. Hence, you're trying to find SK plus one because this is an iterative algorithm, mind you, but it's not sort of iterative optimization problem, but it's an iterative algorithm nevertheless. So you have this K plus one K dynamic there where you're trying to find the K plus first measurement and that's SK plus one, the location. And you're trying to find that by finding the argument, the, the, the value S that maximizes a certain function. Now that means your S is in your set of all measurements, but it's not in the set, set that you've already measured, right? Because you don't want to remeasure what you measured. You want to find a new pixel. But in doing so, you want to find, um, so when you're selecting that S, you're trying to select that X so that it maximizes this argument. And this ac argument is the expected reduction in distortion. So what is distortion? Distortion is your lack of information, right? How bad is your image? You want to reduce that. The, the, the less, the more you know about it, the less the uh, distortion is. So what you want to do is reduce distortion. So we, we end up defining a function called RKS. This is, this is basically the reduction in distortion when the pixel S is measured, right? Given we measured pixels Y of K, right? Y of K was measured. What we want to come up with is the reduction in distortion and reduction is distortion is purely what was, what is your reconstruction now? I mean, what is your reconstruction error before S was measured? What was the reconstruction error after S was measured, right? And based on that, let's try, based on the expected value of that, let's try to find S. And you, the folks that have done uh, probability theory will understand the expectation here. Now, the reason we have an expectation is because we don't know what this is, right? So R, is, R here is a random variable. Y is a random, rather random vector. And, and so because of that, what we can on, only estimate is an expected value, right? Based on a distribution. So that's what we want to try to find. So once we formulated this problem, what we understood is there's a couple of different ways of solving this problem. One problem is trying to model the distribution of the data itself, given the measurements and then compute this, ex um, this expectation. But this becomes very difficult for a multidimensional problem. We tried it. There are things where there are different algorithms that allow you to sample from distributions to get this kind of stuff, but these get, get computationally very inefficient. So what we did instead was uh, come up with a machine learning based algorithm. So the, but before going there, let me just formulate what the algorithm flow looks like. So at the beginning of the problem, you measured some K locations, right? From those K, you need to somehow compute the expected reduction in distortion, right? And then once you, uh, yeah. So once, once, you, um, once you compute that expected reduction in distortion, you could use that to find the S the pixel location that mini maximizes the expected reduction in distortion. That gives you this SK plus one coordinate. And this is this expectation and stuff is done in random signal analysis. You guys might have taken that class. If not, take it. It's a fun course. And it's very, very useful for most of these things we do. And then you measure that pixel, pixel, you see whether you come to a point where you can, you know, reasonably form an image. And if not, you move on, right? to the next measurement, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea behind it is how do you compute this expected reduction in expectation, right? Computing an expectation is technically impossible, right? Because you have to integrate over uh, the, the whole field, but, but instead what we're doing is we're gonna come up with a approximation to that, right? 
And what we did was let's use supervised learning. Let's try to see if we can come up with this expectation or an, well, exp excuse me, come up with uh, an approximation to this um, expectation using machine learning. And how do we formulate that problem again? Expected, what we wanted is the expected value of RK is given YK, right? And we say that it is approximately equal to some FS theta of YK. Let me break that down again. So YK was your measurements that you already made. That's all the information you have, right? Based on that, you need to make a guess. So what we are saying is it's when some function FS operates on that, which is parameterized by theta, right? You can get your expected value. So that means based on the measurements we made, we are going to estimate it. So we are going to estimate the value of the expected reduction and the expected reduction in distortion. There's So the important thing to understand here is you have an image, you have some measurements made on all the measurements that are on all the locations that are not made. You need to come up with a value, like, like a score that tells you how important those different pixels are. And that's what we are doing here. And the way we did that is through a training um, uh, framework that we created for it. This is not based on deep learning. This is based on traditional machine learning. I'm not going to go through that process because, you know, that'll take some time. And I encourage you, if you're interested, reach out to me. I'll be happy to talk about this stuff. And so using that, we estimate this function fs of theta, which is um, the, the parameters are raised by some vector theta. And based off of some of the measurements we make, yf. And based on that, we can make that um, estimation and solve, we've solved that problem to an extent. So once we solve that problem, and this is very important to you, for you when you guys are either in the industry or are you, you're in academia, collaborate, work with other people, right? The reason you want to do that is because that's where you get most value for the work you do, right? Because an, um, an electrical engineer's field of expertise are very different from a material scientist. Right, both are very important. I don't understand what they do. They don't understand what I do. But the important thing is when we talk to each other, we find solutions to problems in their field that we can do with the tools that we have on our field. So that's where you end up becoming a, a person who who does some very theoretical research versus somebody who does a lot of uh, collaboration. And and the important part about collaboration is that's where you get funding, right? And in academia, funding is very important. And also, when you do this kind of research, which has a lot of collaborations, you end up with a lot of publications, which is really good for your future. So how, what we did was we were able to collaborate for, um, we took this algorithm that we developed, right, which is for any generic imaging algorithm, which measures a pixel at a time. And we, we, we did that with the funding of the Air Force Research Lab, the Material Science Division. And that's where we did the theoretical formulation. And we collaborated with them to implement it on a scanning micro, um, electron microscopy, my, my, for scanning electron microscopy. This is one, uh, it's called SEM uh, imaging. Then we took that algorithm, we worked with the analytical chemistry department in Purdue and some folks at Argonne National Lab to adapt it for X-ray diffraction imaging. X-ray diffraction is um, the imaging that's, so basically what they do is they accelerate um, the, 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 basically they have high energy uh, x-rays that are emitted through the particle acceleration process that happens at the, the photon source and you use that to do imaging. That's a very expensive way of imaging but it gives you certain uh, benefits and that's why people do it but the thing is you have very limited time so you want to figure out how you can do that imaging with the least amount of time. So that's why we implemented it there. Then I did an internship in uh, again at Argonne but with another division and we worked with some folks in uh, Northwestern University to do some energy dispersive spectroscopy um, and did some publications there as well. And then we also worked again afterwards with the analytical chemistry to do it for Raman spectroscopy. So all of these different collaborations resulted in a journal paper and a few different conference publications. And that's what's important to me as a researcher, right? I get this portfolio of publications through these different works. So now let me show you some of the results. Um, that um, um, from these different engagements, right? So what I'm, and this will also help you understand what the, exactly the problem is if you didn't understand it. So this is this ground truth. So th this is how the image is supposed to look like. We don't know what this is, okay? We have no idea what this is. The only reason we have this is we actually end up getting the whole image just to see how well we did, right? What we are trying to come up with is this mask. 
basically what pixels to measure in order to get the best understanding of this, right? So this is this is an example. This is these are results, right, of what, what the measurements that we've done. So basically, we are looking at an object that when you fully measure comes up with this image, but instead of measuring the full image, this is the sample mass that our algorithm generates, right, on an iterative basis. And based on the sample mass, this is the reconstruction you make. So this is just five percent of the image, right? And this is not using some fancy deep learning. Um, uh, what do you call that interpolation algorithm? This is just purely nearest neighbor interpolation, which is the simplest form, perhaps, of uh, reconstruction that you get on MATLAB or Python. And what you can see is just by taking five percent, we can come up with the exact image as if we measured one hundred percent, right? Almost all the details that were here are already here, and we only measured five percent, and that's the idea. That was what we were trying to get at, right? How can we get this image with the least amount of measurements? Of course, I, an important distinction to make here is the small. This is the, what we've computed is a small set of measurements, but it is not by any means the optimal set of measurements. Computing the optimal set of measurements is is a is not a not an easy problem to solve. It's a very difficult problem to solve. So instead, what we do is what's called a greedy algorithm. Greedy means at each step we are trying to make the best 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 possible guess. Right? Uh, one moment, please. Sorry. So the idea is that you try to try to come up with um, uh, an algorithm that gives you the um, this is greedy because you're making the best step each time. But making the best step each time doesn't necessarily mean you're taking the best path, right? But this is a more more a path problem. But anyways, more to that, more on that later. If you guys have more questions on that, so next is uh, another example. This particular one, we this this particular uh, experiment was done on um, the Northwestern University campus. And this particular sample we are working on is um, just to give you some context. This was with some group that we worked with um, and we collaborated with. This was the sort of the dendrite that I was showing you earlier. This is a, a, a material science people at Northwestern. And this sample itself has been to the Inter International Space Station and back because there were some experiments done on that over there for some sort of dendrite formation and all that. But what we used it was for uh, just measuring the, uh, the different regions in that. So what you see here, is the full algorithm in action, right? You see, you start off with some measurements and you sort of start understanding more and more of what might be in the image and then you start focusing on different areas. So I'll let the video run and let you understand it. So the idea is you don't know the ground truth, right? You don't know what's underneath and you're trying to guess what's in there. So you're trying to hone into these different areas that have the most texture and as you see, you know, you, you're honing in on these edges more, right? That's because that's where the most information gain is. Because you have an image with boundaries. And the more you know about the boundaries, the less your error is. And that's why you have this focusing in on boundaries. So, so this is just a, a video that shows um, this experiment. And as you see, this allows for a better reconstruction of what's underneath. Then the next one I'm going to show is called Raman spectroscopy. This was an uh, image generated by one of my colleagues. This actually shows you the full full thing, right? So on the on 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 the left hand side top is the pixels measured. This is the image reconstruction re reconstructed from that, and this is the reconstruction error, right? And on on the bottom, you show the, what they show is a, is a comparison. If you do random samples, right, and it goes through this plot as 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 you go through it, you see how the distortion is reduced with this kind of a targeted algorithm as opposed to a random measurement algorithm. So you see it hones in to these different areas that gives you a reconstruction of, of what the image looks like and you have the reconstruction that comes on the outside. What you will notice, what you might have noticed in all of these images is these look very simple images, right? These look like, okay, this is three colors. It's a simple image. We can reconstruct it, yes. But the idea is in order to form these images, that's not that's the less straightforward problem, right? These are formed by different kinds of microscopy or spectroscopy or you know, different kinds of imaging. And these take a lot of time. So this each of these labels means a different material is present here, right? As opposed to another area which has another different material present. So we are trying to distinguish between them and find boundaries there. So since we have um, at about 40 minutes, I'm going to go to the next part of the talk. So, you know, if you have questions on those, please let me know. These are the citations of the stuff we did, the, all the publications we got out of that. And the reason I mentioned these here is to give you an idea of, you know, what are the different references you could look at in order for you to get an understanding about these things, right? 
So if there are any questions on this part of the talk, before we move on to the next part, please let me know. So I'll open it up for questions and uh, um, Saumya and uh, Praveen, uh, Sandalu, if, if you guys want to mediate some questions here, we could do that or we can ask at the end. I think the preferred, uh, okay, I've been told it's better the, at the end. So let's move on. Let's move on to the next part. Now, this is a very casual part, right? This is very much in, in, in my eyes and how I've seen it. My experience in graduate school, getting into graduate school, how you getting, get into graduate school from within the US, from outside the US, what matters, right? All, for all of us, the same things matter. I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna structure it as basically, why do you wanna get into grad school? How do you get in there? I mean, there are more than one, there's more than one way. I'm just telling you of what I understand are the best ways. And then what lies for you after you graduate from, from grad school, right? So of course, why you wanna to go to graduate school is so you can say um, when you put it on your resume that you have a master's degree or a PhD, right? That's, that's, that's the easy part, right? That's the easy part of understanding what it is. It's an extra qualification. But what does an extra qualification really mean, right? What does that actually give you in addition to what you have from your undergraduate, right? So let's first talk about a master's degree. So the pros of getting a master's degree, right? You can get a little bit more, not a little bit more, a lot more advanced subject knowledge. So you've learned random signal analysis, you've learned systems theory, you know, you've learned a lot of different things when you're in undergraduate, but you haven't learned everything, right? And a lot of the things that you learn are the initial assumptions that lead to the um, what, what you're going to learn in your master's, right? A little bit about some things that were not explained in detail. That's what you're going to learn there. You're going to learn a little bit more in depth. You're going to learn more about the mathematics. You're going to learn more about the false assumptions we made in, uh, in undergrad. You'll we'll learn more about why they're not exactly true, etc. Then, you know, once you do a master's, what's the advantage, right? You might get a little bit more pay, right? Than, than you get with an undergraduate, right? And then, um, so that, that the other important part is that, you know, industry in um, the uh, sort of the, the more developed countries where you have like your, your the East and the West all over the place, right? You have Canada, USA, you have Europe, countries like Singapore, Japan, South Korea, the China, all of those areas, your industry work is, is not really limited to, uh, no, well, not really limited, right? You need a lot of advanced theory because you actually do a lot of product design, right? You do a lot of product uh, understanding, design, that's where things are made. And that not everything, not, you don't hand off everything to people with PhDs, right? That's not the case. The people, the, what people with PhDs do are very specific problems. The people with masters, the people with even bachelors do is product design. And a lot of the research is done with these as well. So understanding theory is extremely important in order to get jobs in these, in, in electrical engineering, in, in the industry, in these developed, developed countries, right? Because, because there's a lot of design, there's a big design element in there as well. So the other advantage is if you're planning to migrate to the US, having a master's makes it, having a master's from the US or having a master's from Canada or a recognized place is important. If you go to a place like Canada, that adds to your points. If you're in a place like the US, you know, you go into a different visa category, right? That, that, that's the other thing. And then it's easier to get into, you know, the mass, when you compare a master's to a PhD, getting into a master's program is easier than getting into a PhD program. That might be obvious to you uh, because a PhD basically is a five-year commitment by the university to have some person work for them and they're going to pay for them. They're going to take care of them. The master's is different. And that's also one of the cons, right? You don't really get, a, not many people get, scholarships to do masters. You pretty, pretty, most people have to pay for them. So, you know, that's another thing that you have to weigh when you're trying to consider between a master's and a PhD. So then how about a PhD, right? Well, this is with comparison mostly to a master's, right? Not comparing to a bachelor's because we're at the next step now. Your pay will increase. You'll get a little bit more when you graduate with a PhD than a master's, but you have to understand that if you do a master's, you get extra three or four years of experience. So you might actually end up being at the pay, same pay bracket. So do, definitely don't go to do a PhD because as opposed to a master, because you think you're going to get paid more. That's not true, right? The quality, then the next problem is quality of work, right? Quality of work is, is a very personal decision. I can't say that a, what, what one person does is better than, um, what I do is better than what somebody else does. This is a very relative thing. It all depends on what you want to do, what you find fascinating and what you find 
makes you the happiest, right? And that means if a P, if you want to do a PhD, that means you really enjoy going far into like going into the depths of a problem, right? You know, you might not end up seeing the bigger picture. You might end up diving down, focusing in one area and working on that for many years, right? Or many months, if you're in industry, for example. But with a master's or bachelor's, sometimes your work is not that focused. You get to get a more broader picture of what's going on. Then advancement wise, that means promotions, right? No significant difference. It doesn't matter. Like you having a PhD might even actually be sort of a slight, uh, you know, because then, then you're going into the research aspect. Then you're not going, some, pe some people go into the management area with PhDs, but not all do. So it's, it's, it's sort of a different area. Then migration wise, typically having a PhD gives you a much better chance in most places. It adds a lot of points for your New Zealand, Australia, Canada applications. For the US, you have different visa categories uh, based on the quality of your work. You know, if the quality of the work is really good, you get what's called this Einstein visa, which is, which gives you, which puts you in the uh, front of the line and you can get your visa very fast. And I know some people who are going through that process. It's, it, it's very, very, uh, you know, in that sense, it's very important. Availability of jobs with a master's, probably you have more job opportunities than you have with a PhD. And, and with the PhD, one of the very, very important parts is the quality of your PhD matters a lot, right? That quality of your PhD doesn't necessarily mean the best, you go to the best rated university. That's not it. That's one aspect of it. But the most important part is, sorry, there are three most important parts. What's the school? Who's your professor? Who's your professor is probably the most important part. And then who's your professor? What was the work you did? And what is the university you went through? In that order is what, what gets you jobs, right? Because that puts you in front of the right people. Because if, you're, if the university you went to and the professor you worked for have students in different areas, in, in, in different research labs, that's how you get into jobs, right? You, you can apply on monster.com or LinkedIn, but your chances are always better, much better when you know somebody there, right? And knowing somebody there, the easiest way to know it is if they were in the same school as you. And then even more so if they were in the same lab as you, right? And, and that's how you apply for jobs. So the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about the PhD because that's the one I know about. I did a master's, but that was sort of on the way. And I didn't uh, did any do any cost benefit analysis there because, you know, that's just, just part of what I needed to do because I felt like doing it on the way. So the first part is how do you maximize your chance of getting into a good PhD program, right? Now, this is, this is a very subjective thing, right? Once when I asked my professor, he said it's, it's really... It's not a one dimensional problem. I can't say this is important. I can't say that is important. There are so many different things. And it all it also depends on the particular faculty that's evaluating it. So what, ca what can we do as students? What we do need to do is maximize the probability of getting in, right? How do we maximize the probability of getting in? By making sure that all on all the different aspects of um, 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 uh, consideration or rather the important avenues, we do the best we can. First thing is good grades. That's essential, right? I mean, you have to be, if you're trying to get into a top PhD program, you want to be in the top 10% of your class. That's a given, right? And, and this 10% this becomes smaller and smaller, the less recognized your university may be, right? So if you, for example, graduate with an undergrad from Princeton, getting into a top 10 program, you can get into one of those being in the top 25% perhaps, right? Because, you know, you're already in a very recognized program, right? And then you go a little down, further down the ladder, you might get me to get into the top 10%. And the further down the ladder, top 2%, top 1%. That's how you can show that you're the best of who you've been working with, right? And then a very, very important key aspect, something I personally did not do much of because in that time, um, you know, we didn't have, so most of you students are very fortunate that you have advisors that, give you talks like this, have people come and talk to you about things like this, tell you what you need to do. Even though I went to school in the US, have not having this kind of a structure did not, you know, did not avail me to some of these, um, you know, opportunities out there, right? That, that you have to do uh, undergraduate research that maximizes your chances, right? And now another thing you have to understand is I went to school eight years ago. That's not a whole long time ago, but eight or nine years ago, actually. That's not a long time ago, but times have changed so much. Now it's extremely competitive, right? 
competition is at an all time high because you know now it's not it's not most people are from the us and then 10% from outside now it's 90% from all over the world so that means you're not just competing with people from the us you're competing with china you're competing with india you're competing with japan china everything right these are huge countries with huge populations and a lot of intellectuals right there's no distinction that makes sri lankan students better than anybody else we are all pretty much the same and we comes to it right so it's about you try to maximize what you've done and the way you can distinguish yourself the most right is through research because the rating of the university is not something you have zero control over right what you have control over is your personal uh, um, portfolio and that is your grades and more importantly your research because grades are subjective and it's based on your university nobody knows what a 4.0 out of 4.0 in university of peradeniya means right that's a very subjective thing right only a person who went there knows how good it is but research is peer reviewed when you publish in cvpr people know what cvpr is it's an almost an objective metric and objective metrics are where you want to maximize yourself right and that's why research is important that's why journals if you can and conference papers are extremely important right so get into research programs you know get in with talk to your advisors your professors i mean and then talk, try to get into these things if you can doing good work they are doing publishable work puts you in in the front of the queue right and and there's no better determining factor for you then references from respected academics the the fourth part the reference from respected academics you won't get that if you don't have publications right somebody can say hey this guy has really good grades and let's say my professor sees that and he's like what does this mean to me it doesn't mean anything to me because i don't know what the classes are like there right but if your reference is a person who worked with you on research and says okay we did this work we published this together in cvpr that actually matters right so that is what you need to focus on if you want to get into grad school because it's getting increasingly difficult right next once you're done with all that start early you know don't like when you want to join something make a plan right if you want to join um, um a program and i've had the privilege of working with some of the students at peradeniya through my brother and through uh, dr parak parakrama and uh, some other professors and and you know i've seen that they do really high quality work that's that's amazing because that's what that's what's going to differentiate you so you know my advice is if you can do during your undergraduate period do it if you have to take one or two extra years and do a be a research engineer to pick up your portfolio do it because what you want is to your capability go to the best university right not everybody can go to mit right but the thing is some can some can't but you as a person it's your responsibility to yourself that you do the best you can to maximize your possibility of getting to the best place you can and the way you do that is through research and nothing else right so speak with and when you're done with all of that start early start speaking with speaking with professors that you like to work with in the us in canada in new zealand in singapore in japan wherever you want to go right talk to them understand what they need understand what they're looking for right and and also understand the fact that people who are in the admission panel some of them are the professors and if a professor wants you in the program and if it's a reputed professor they will get you right professors have a lot of power in university so if they say i want this guy you're going to get that guy like the professor the, the university will get that guy so impress people that matter right impress professors by talking to them by making them see what you've done and then finally sop and standardized tests right sop is for the administration just as professors the initial screening comes from your administrators right these are not academics to that traditional professor degree these are people who are in the administration street they need to they will be reading your sop understanding whether you are right fit so you know writing is important revising those writing is that writing is important that's how we make that tick mark standardized test it, if you get 16 i don't know what the metric is let's say 100 for gre if you get 100 out of 100 you're not getting into mit that that's not true but if you don't get 95 for example these are all quoted numbers right if you don't get 95 out of 100 you won't even qualify right so that's the thing you you need to make sure that you 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 are at that tier where you can even be considered sop by the way means statement of purpose that's where you explain why you want to do a phd right 
like you you go over what you've done what makes you a good candidate what do you know what have i published and what why would uh, x university benefit from having me as a graduate student right so that's how you maximize your admission chance then once everything works out you're in the university right how do you choose the professor you work with most of the time you know it's not like you get to go and choose whoever you want and they'll take you in no first thing about this choosing your professor business is the professor needs to want to work with you also so professors have tons of students coming to them students have to go to professors and try to get in but when you're considering whom you want to work with it's very very important before you apply to work with these professors understanding what they do who they are because at the end of the day you will be working with based on which country you are in which program you are in i'm just talking about my experience in purdue typical phd's are from 4 to 7 years right mostly 5 6 years so you'll be working for one person directly under them for 5 or 6 years a significant chunk of the time you'll be alive right that's assuming you, you you're alive for 100 years that's 5% of the time and the first 10 years you don't even know what you did so it's a significant portion and 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 it is a significant portion that will have repercussions for the rest of your career so it's very important you choose the professor based on a few different criteria first there's no perfect professor every professor has goods every professor has bads right and get into work with any of the professors in a top program is a privilege right so you know take it as it comes but if you can try to see if they are a temperament match for you what do i mean by that that you can deal with them some professors can be very challenging to work with some professors can be very easy to work with but some professors can be micromanagers some professors might not manage your work right for example my professor did not micromanage he's a senior professor so he doesn't have time to go over everybody's work so he would let you do your own work you come back to him in a month but if you're not used to working independently and you want more guidance more involvement you go with a junior professor right who has two or three students or one student or two student two students and they work more intimately with you but some people like myself for example i don't like people meddling with every little part of what i do so i i like that structure where i have i, I have a senior professor whom i report to every now and again and i talk to him more on an abstract basis right that's important and the best way of understanding what your professor is like is by talking to students in that lab so once you get into a university you might get in in, in either a teaching assistant scholarship a research assistant scholarship or a fellowship on none of the above right if you get in with a fellowship you you get money you don't have to worry about anything for a little while you can shop around for professors if you get in with no um scholarship at all that means you're spending a lot of money so best find a professor soon but again do what you need to do in order to find them if you get in a teaching assistantship the good thing is you you, are, you you the bad thing is you have to teach but it's not a bad thing it's really good to teach so you know it's good what i mean by bad is it takes some of your time right so it it takes time away from what you can use for um your research or your classes but the good thing is you you actually end up how to teach which which is which is how you learn you know how you become thorough with any subject but anyhow that aside that allows you the liberty to go and go and look for professors right so the whole idea is find a professor based on your based on few things temperament match your academic goals what do you want to do research in right and then what do you want to do after you graduate do you want to go into the industry r and d do you want to go into a national lab do you want to go into academia or do you want to go into other industry position right based on that different professors are better so if you want to go into academia you want to go with a professor who publishes a lot right and who does fundamental research not application research what is fundamental research what is application research it's a blurred line but the idea is you, in in the fundamental research you develop a theory from scratch you start with modeling the problem right so the reason i chose my professor is because with him i can go into one of the three categories academia government or industry r and d because he does fundamental research he he lets you explore a problem from the very beginning and then mathematically model it do proofs publish proofs and then publish applications right so but if you are going in the more application research area that means you know you use some of the theory that's already out there and then you apply it to different problems 
that will get you into your industry, perhaps into industry R and D, not always, but definitely into other industry positions. And none of these are better than the other. It's all about what you want, right? Academia basically means getting into becoming an um, assistant professor or an associate professor uh, or a postdoc to start with. Uh, government or national lab research, this might be not, not might not be something familiar to you there. But in the US, we have what are called research labs funded by the government. The Department of Defense and the Department of Energy have a bunch of research labs. So I, I don't know whether you guys remember, I talked about Air Force Research Lab. I talked about Argonne National Labs. I talked about... Uh, and. Uh, I think that's those are the two I talked about. Argonne National Labs is part of the Department of Energy Research Labs. There are about, I think, eight of those. Uh, Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Berkeley, you've heard, probably heard these names. And then you have the DOD Research Labs, which is, uh, I think, Lawrence Livermore. You have the AFRL, Navy Research Lab, that kind of stuff. I worked with the Air Force folks, right? So that's another national lab area. So that's that's sort of academic, but you don't have the teaching aspect. It's purely research. I have a lot of colleagues actually in the national lab area and in the industry R&D. Industry R&D is some of the larger companies, right? Name your like your you know your Googles, your Apples, your Amazons, your Samsungs, your um, all of those like larger companies which have which have um, 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 which have the money and the capacity to do research and are designing the next generation products. Your Qualcomm's, all of those, right? Nvidia's, etc. They have research labs. So these research labs are uh, not the level of uh, in-depth research that you do in national labs or academia, but you do research more targeted towards the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Within the industry, but it's still R&D. And, and the cool thing is you can, I know people who've done industry R&D and have gone to academia. So for example, in the lab I worked in, in Texas Instruments, there were pre previous, people who are there who have gone to become faculty at MIT, faculty at uh, University of Michigan, faculty at all over the place. And that the same thing is for national labs. You work in national labs, you can go to these areas. And I know folks who've been in industry R&D who go to national labs afterwards and people in national labs who go to industry R&D. So within these three, there's a lot of interchange right, that you could do, but it all is based on the kind of work you do. But other industry positions typically are more on the development side. So that means it's get, it gets harder to get back into research, right? So doesn't mean research isn't the best, no, by no means is research the best thing you could do with your life. It's what, if, if, if that's what you want to do, that's all I'm, to, I'm, I'm referring to here. So now let's dive into a little bit of these things, right? Becoming a professor. Becoming a professor is the hardest thing that you could do when you try to, when you graduate from um, the university, right? Because especially if you want to get into the top 10 or top 20 universities, I'm, I'm just going to take US as an example. If you really want to get into a, become a faculty in the top 20 universities here, it's extremely difficult, right? It's extremely difficult to the point where uh, it's nearly impossible right out of uh, grad school. Not impossible, but nearly impossible, right? To just to give you an example, um, Katie, Bauman, we, whom we were talking about uh, previously with uh, respect to the black hole imaging stuff. She's now faculty at Caltech, but even she, she did a PhD at MIT. She did a postdoc after that before getting into a faculty in Caltech, right? So that's how difficult these things are. You have to, you have to first do your PhD. You have to do a postdoc for one to three years. And that postdoc has to have a lot of publications in there in order for them to even consider them. You know, I've, like when I was at Purdue, they, they were interviewing candidates for professors. And what they do is when they have talks, they um, um, circulate the resumes with graduate students so that we can see who's coming to talk. The amount of publications these folks have are ridiculous, right? They have 15, 20 journal papers. And when you get into research, you'll understand how difficult the journal paper is. 15, 20, at least in top tier journals, right? And then 30, 40 conference papers. It's in, in, the, in the amount of work that is required is insane. But when you get in, there are a lot of good things there as well. But the main thing to understand is getting out of a PhD program, you're not getting into faculty in a top tier university. You're, you, most likely you'll have to do a postdoc unless you're it's like some sort of a genius, which I hope you know that's the case, but that's not the case for most people, right? Then the next part is national lab research. This typically is your Department of Energy, Department of Defense ones, right? For these, you need to, again, you enter the national lab as a postdoc, and then 
out of those postdocs, a few people are, get to go on to become research scientists. So it's very similar to the um, academic positions. It's not as competitive, but it is still very competitive. Getting fellowships in these national labs is as competitive as getting, getting into academia, very difficult. Then the next one is industry R&D. Industry R&D is also quite competitive, right? I mean, the thing is, there are more industry R&D positions than there are academic positions in top tier universities. So obviously it's a supply demand problem. Right, so you have more opportunities into industry R and D, but it's all of these also depend on what you want to do. I personally don't like being a professor, not because it's not an amazing profession; it's just not what I like to do. I don't like working in national labs because industry R and D gives you know gives you an opportunity to advance within the industry, to go into management, things like that. So because of that, I like industry R and D, and that's why I picked that. And uh, so based on which research lab you choose within industry, there's a big balance between the letter R and the letter D, right? Letter R stands for research, letter D stands for development, right? So the more closer you are to a product, the more your D will be, the less your R will be. But that again is not a reflection of how good the lab is. It's just a reflection of what you want to do. So I have a colleague in Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab. Uh, that's part of Mitsubishi and they do like, that's the, he, for example, does a lot of very, very involved mathematical research in controls. And, and that means publishing in journals, publishing in conferences. So I also work in industry R&D, but in my case, it's 50-50 almost, right? Or, or like 60-50, 60-R. We publish, but we don't go to the extent of publishing in journals because we go more into patent patent publications and conference paper publications. And we also directly support certain products, right? Because of that, that means your research aspect is not as in-depth as you get into other ones, right? So that's that's the balance. And each lab has its own balance, right? And it all depends on, on, on what, 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 your, what your manager does, what the company expects of you, et cetera. Then you have your other industry positions which is like sort of the development area. That means you, you know, you really get to do the research aspect. You do most of more of the development part. And, you know, that is as prestigious as doing anything else. But the, the difference is other industry, you can't jump back into research. It's very difficult. But if you remain in these three, you typically get a chance to go either way based on the kind of work you do. So now that sort of concludes my talk, right? And what I want 